haven't days gone by, but they're always available on Grace uh, Church uh, webpage, and Cindy, my, our uh, admin, ad administrator, puts them on there, and hopefully you're availing yourself of those and printing those and so on, so we're glad for that. Uh, we're in our series, today is the second week of our series in that wonderful book of Hebrews, and today we've entitled the message, Warning Number Two. The warning number two, the danger of unbelief. The danger of unbelief. You know, we said it last week, not all warnings are of equal value. We live in a world where there's warnings everywhere. You go to McDonald's, you can't get a, a coffee without the warning on the, this may be hot, right? There was a lawsuit, you know, warning. When I was in, ch in, ch in elementary school as a child, back, back when, some of you remember that, most of you won't, but we actually had air raid drills where we crawled under our desk in case the Russians were going to bomb us. The warning, the sirens would go out, the kids would be under their desk. We never thought any more about it, but the, the desk is going to protect us from, a, from a, that kind of a bomb. Crazy. I don't, I don't think so. You know, even this morning, I came down, I get very early in the morning, stagger down the step. We have one of these simply safe household alarms, and I forgot to turn it off. So then about an hour and a half later, when Faithy came down, she opened the door to look out the back, and all of a sudden, the warning, ah, ah, ah. I have news for you. That warning is not the same important value as the warning, warning that we hear in Hebrews and the warning we're going to hear today. And that warning may mean something, and it does. In most cases, it doesn't, because I forget to turn the alarm off. But the warnings of the Word of God are extremely important. They result in life and in death. And we do pay heed uh, to them, and we're wise to do that, not allow that drowning of, oh no, here it comes, another warning. No, no, uh, this is God speaking, and we need to take this to heart. Well, warning number two in the book of Hebrews, the danger of un unbelief. God designed our bodies to need rest. Have you ever notice that? Some of you are tend still like, I'm a little sleepy now, maybe I get some rest. Right, God designed us to sleep. It's a strange uh, thing that we spend about one third of our life laying down. I mean, think about it, eight hours, if you sleep eight hours out of 24, that's one third of your life. That's a lot of time laying about as if we we're prone, like we were dead men and women. But it is a sweet gift. And sometimes we don't realize that until it evades us. We're worried, we're sick, or something, and we can't sleep. We're like, I've got to get my sleep, i got to get my rest, or I won't be able to function, no one will be able to live with me, they won't be able to stand me. You know, right? We understand that. It's such a wonderful gift that God designed our bodies. And it's one thing to go to bed dog-tired. I did that last night. I went, dog-tired. And then to wake up in the morning, and I feel regenerative energies from rest and sleep. It's a gift. God gives air to breathe and water and food and shelter. He allows us and sleep is one of those. That's Psalm 127. Oftentimes it's misquoted there where it says, and God grants sleep to those he loves. The Hebrew is kind of broken up there. Now it is true, I'll say that, that God does give us sleep and we're glad for that. We, he lays us down in green pastures, right? But even more wonderful, that Psalm 127 doesn't say he gives us sleep. He gives, the idea is, even while sleeping, God is working behind the scenes to bring about his perfect will and answer our prayers and his will for our life when we could be no less involved. God is working. That, that, that's a wonderful verse there. And something you might have been thinking, well, God gives sleep to those who don't know. God gives even while sleeping and so on. It's a wonderful, wonderful verse. Wow. Well, did you know that rest in the Bible is used in a number of ways? And the Israelites were thinking of going to Canaan, uh, to, the, uh, to the land of Canaan, and uh, would find rest, repeatedly, rest. They were coming out of Egypt, they would find rest there in Canaan. Uh, rest. God created the heavens and the earth, and after it says, and he rested. He ceased from his labor. Didn't expend any energy. He just stopped. He rested. For you and I, it's regenerative. We feel rest and energy. In other places, wonderfully, it's a figure of the Sabbath rest 
that we have in salvation. The end of our, our labors and our working and all of that to try and some sort of merit, some human righteousness to, that God would allow us into his heaven. And we come to the end of it. We realize that we, the gospel is good news and bad. And the bad news is what we have done. We are sinners. We are lawbreakers. We can't. God did it all. It's a finished work. And we receive it. We enter into his Sabbath rest. That Jesus is the Sabbath, the rest, the peace. And so on. Well, the book of Hebrews, I remind you, is written to uh, Hebrew Christians in the early church. Uh, they're Jews that had uh, made a profession of faith in Jesus, and uh, were now beginning to feel great persecution from their kin, their family, friends, those in the community. You're trusting Jesus? Oh, that's and and they and they're feeling the pressure in their environment, work, school to and they were they were thinking of chucking it, forgetting it. And uh, the author of Hebrews writes this uh, 13 chapter book as we know it and it presents a theme the superiority of Jesus, that the new covenant is far superior to the old covenant. The old covenant of Moses, the new covenant of Jesus that Jeremiah prophesied about. And to go back is to, to go back to nothing. All of that were the shadows and the types and the forerunners pointing to Jesus. All of that. And to go back is, uh, is to miss salvation completely. And so it's, it's written to professed believers. There's a difference between professed believers and possessed believers. Profess makes a confession of faith. Oh, I believe in Jesus. He's mine, right? But it may not be genuine. It could be family pressure, it could be peers, it could be the community, right? But there's no possession. I said last week, it's like the old evangelist say, don't miss heaven by 12 inches, where you know a lot about Jesus, and you move around a lot, around a lot of people that seem to know Jesus, but you have never personally put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a professed Christian, but not a possessed one. And these were feeling the persecution and thinking of chucking it. God's final and complete revelation is in Jesus. That sevenfold description we saw a couple of weeks ago, there is no going back. Now there are five warnings. This reads like a sermon. And I've written plenty of sermons. And, and, and I think it is. And in the midst of this superiority of Christ, he has five warning sections. Five serious warning sections. Last week we saw chapter 2, the first. Uh, resist the drift, if you will. If we neglect so great a salvation that is found in Jesus, there remains no hope for us. There is no escape, is what he is saying. And some of us can be so involved with Christendom and things of Christ and our parents, maybe our grandparents, and, and so we know a lot about Jesus, but we've never trusted him. And so we might just know and then drift by and miss that safe harbor that's found in Jesus. And there's no escape. And then he moves on after that morning, and he talks about, uh, having talked about the angels, Jesus superior to the angels, then he talks about Jesus superior to Moses. Moshe, the great, the great patriarch of the Old Testament, that Jesus is far superior to him. Moses was a servant in the house of God. Jesus is the son of God. He's the builder of the house. The, the son is far superior than to the servant there. And Moses couldn't even lead the children of Israel into the promised land. He couldn't do it. Moses represents the law. The law could never do it. And Jesus is only able to enter us into that land of rest and salvation that is found in it through his cross. And so, uh, so today, so today, we're going to look at this warning now because he stops now in the end of cha at chapter 3, verse 7, and, and goes into chapter 4. If you have your Bible, you might want to turn to that. Uh, uh, Hebrews 3, 7 through 4, 13 is the passage that... I remind you, uh, the, the, the verses in the chapters were not part of the original. Stephanus in, included them in the 1500s, and we're glad he did, right? Where was that found? I can't find it. It'll take forever. Sermons would be four hours long, right? I can't find it. We go like, turn to Hebrews 3, 7. Thank you. There it is. Well, let's read this. We're going to notice the danger of unbelief, and we're going to know particularly there are two parts Two parts of God's warning urging us, don't miss 
the rest that God provided through faith in his son. Don't miss it. Don't miss it through unbelief. That's what he's saying. Let's pick it up in Hebrews 3, 7. So, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do, it, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, and for 40 years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation and said, their hearts are always going astray, they have not known my ways, so I declare that oath, and in my anger, they shall never enter into my rest. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As, just, uh, as has just been said uh, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and re rebelled? Were they not all those that Moses had led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies uh, fell in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that would, they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, chapter 4, 1, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful uh, that, that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed uh, enter that rest, just as God has said, so I declare an oath in, in, in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all his work. And again in the passage above he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again sent a certain day calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as he said before today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. There are two parts to this warning, this warning that warns us against the danger of uh, unbelief. Unbelief, what, what do we mean by that? Well, the first, first one is disbelief. You should know that our passage always leads to a restlessness, and it ends in death. It always does. There's a rest. There's no peace for the weary, no peace for the wicked. Why are the nations enraged and people imagine strange things? Psalm chapter 2. Well, why do we say disbelief? Disbelief always leads to, to restlessness. Why disbelief versus unbelief? It sound, they sound very similar, right? But I choose the word disbelief because uh, to unbelieve is not to, it simply means not to believe, okay? Do not believe, do not trust, do not rest, do not exercise faith in whatever it is, right? But disbelief is stronger. It means in the, in the, in the, in the fullness of all sorts of evidences, refusing, see the key? Refusing to believe and trust and rest in God. There's the refusal aspect there. It's just simply like I'm in unbelief. Huh? In the midst of multitude upon multitude, multitude of glorious examples of the glory and greatness, provision, protection of God, I refuse. It's no wonder God is, that hates 
unbelief, and he hates the disobedience of unbelief, and so on. And so Israel had repeatedly seen the provision of God. Uh, the writer here is quoting Psalm 95. Some of you recognize that as David wrote that, and he talks about the children of Israel and all the blessings that they had, and uh, as God cared for them, you think of that generation, right? And uh, had delivered them from Egypt with the ten plagues, protected them, probably a million, million and a half people were thrown out of the country when Pharaoh's son died. Please get out of here. They were there in Egypt for 400 years. The last 200, they were like slaves and built many of the cities there. And God protected them, blessed them, rose up Moses to be their leader. And then he, they, they leave, and as soon as they leave, Pharaoh says, oh, no, what did I do? I lost my, my chief labor here, right? And he sends his army after him, right? Wait, I changed my mind, right? <laughs> and so he's chasing them now, men, women, and children, right? And they're fleeing, and they come to the Red Sea. Oh, no, what are we going to do now? The people, the children, they cry out, here we are, you brought us out here to die, right? And what does uh, God, Moses prays to God, and then, and then he tells the people, stand back and watch the deliverance of the Lord. I mean, a million and a half people in the Red Sea. It, it just, some of you think of the great movies, and parts, and there they cross over and deliver with the hot on pursuit, the Egyptian army. There they go, men, women, and children, and babies across, and here comes the Egyptian army, and God drowns them. Now some will say, well, it wasn't that deep, it was ankle deep. Well, then you're compounding miracles. You got the drowning of the Egyptian, the mighty Egyptian army in a foot and a half of water. That's even a greater miracle. No, God protected them. Then when they got over there, right? Now what are we going to eat? There's no McDonald's, Burger King, can't go to anywhere. No Wendy's burgers, sorry, Chick-fil-A, that's gone. No, none of that, right? And God provides something they never saw on the exact day, every morning, six days a week, manna, the bread of angels, it said one place. And they go out and gather it. That's not bad. They make bagels and pizzas and all kinds of things. With this food, God provided. And then they're thirsty. No drinking fountains, no Dr. Pepper, nothing, right? No iced tea. That's southern iced tea, right? None of that. And then what are they going to do? God provides water for them. He feeds them, he clothes them, he protects them from behind, he guides them forward, uh, and, and they go to Sinai, right? Mount Sinai, the, the law, the covenant, they're there, uh, there's rebellion, God forgives, Moses prays, and it should have been an 11-day journey to the promised land. Deuteronomy 1 tells us that. 11 days. You ever move an army? I mean, I, we've gone on vacation, and I felt like getting everything packed up, helping fate, loading the car, checking everything, getting the three kids in the car. Remember that, right? I'm moving an army, right? You feel like I'm entrenched in cement. We're never going to get there, right? Finally, you get in the car. Imagine moving 1.5 million people, right? 11 days journey. They come to Kadesh Barnea, right? And uh, they're going, hey, let's send in the spies in the land, right? And uh, then one from each of the tribe, tribal leaders, go look at this land of milk and honey. Isn't it great? Wow, oh, God's going to give us it. And God said, I will give you the land. Now, they've, they've seen all of this, right? All of this, God's care and protection and all the way leading, all, all of this. They're up to here in it, right? And they go, and the, lead, and the leaders, the spies from the land, they come back, and they said, it's true, the land is incredible, incredible, it's fruitful, the vines, the fruit, oh, it's lush. But you know what, they got giants in the land. I mean, they were big guys, and they looked mean. And they came back with their report, ten of them and said, we can't do it. We can't. Only Josh and Caleb said, wait, what? Wait, what? Wait, yeah, wait. And uh, they stirred the hearts of the people, and the people rebelled against God. Another case where the majority were wrong. How about that, right? And uh, God said, that's it. Disobedience. Willful refusal to believe in the face of all of this evidence of God's sweet care and protection. Refusing to take God at his word. You know, there's some things God can't do. That's a great title for a sermon. Some things, we all think God's all the omnis and all the, these 
all powerful, almighty, those ever, ever present, right? But there's something God can't do. You know what they are? God cannot lie. Cannot lie. They that have the Son have life. Don't you love that? God can't lie. If you have the Son, you have life forever. And God said, I'm going to give you the land. That's a matter of saying, God said it. That's what it You know? It didn't really matter whether you were. God said it. I believe it, and that's settled. No, no, you're not part of the equation. God said it, and that's settled. It. <laughs> and God said, I'm going to give you the land. They didn't believe. They didn't trust him in the face of all of this and let the restlessness. So unbelief just leads to restlessness and loss, and it ends in death. We read that, and their bodies were strewn in the desert. You say you're worried about your kids. I'm going to give the land to your kids. And not you. You're going to die here in the wilderness because of unbelief. And that's the warning that the author is saying here. He said, look, the, the superiority is Jesus. He's everything. He's the final revelation. Of, he's, he is our Redeemer, our Lord, Son of God, Son of Man. Do not turn away. Possess this which is salvation. There is hope nowhere else except in Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And remember, he used my own remember what David said of those in Moses' day, the millions of people that died, and then maybe a million adults in, in the wilderness for 40 years, because they refused to trust God. This belief leads to restlessness. Why did I say restlessness? And there we go. They, all they did was circle. They circled for 40 years. They, they turned away. God said, and, and, and you, you, some of you know the text, but another, some said, like, Oh, yes, I think God will give it to us. Let's try. And God says, Too late. Don't try. Don't go. No, it's too late. Late obedience is disobedience. And they were wiped out, right? And, then, and, and so on. And, you know, our Bibles have 66 books. All, they all present Jesus, Creator, Genesis, Exodus, the Deliverer, right? Um, Leviticus, the priesthood. You know, have to think about it. It really should never have been in Numbers, at least a good portion of it, in the book of Deuteronomy. Never should have been. I mean, sin, disobedience, wasted time and death. Because the book of Numbers, you might call it the longest funeral march in history. You know, as a pastor, I've led some funeral processions, you know, leading and then the then the hearse is behind, and then the dear close families and dear friends, and, and I've seen some very long ones. I've been involved with some long ones. Usually they're sudden, traumatic, shocking death, usually young. I can think, think of some of these. Yeah. This is the long, the book of Numbers, the longest funeral march in history. This belief brings restlessness, ends in death. Don't be a professor of Christ. No, because mom and dad or brother or sister or someone, uh, and, and with the, the, the heat of the, of the trouble now, the persecution, that's why the persecuted church is a more pure church. It thins out the wheat and the tares. So if it really costs something to stand for Jesus, hey, I'm out. It's not culturally pleasing. I'm, I, I'm out. You know, and so it has a purifying effect. Look at China today, the great underground church that suffered so much in other parts of the world, Indonesia and other places that we are a little aware of, Arab countries and Muslim countries, where there's, it's a pure church, it's a cost something. And if you're baptized there as a believer in Christ, that means everything, and you'll be disinherited from your family. Well, that separates the genuine from the facsimile, the possessor from the professor. And he's saying, don't stop, don't to be encouraged. So, so what, what's his answer here? He says, encourage one another. Encourage one another. Uh, as we gather together as a church, we encourage one another. We, we share. We, we share each other's burdens. We help with difficult problems. We give counsel. We pray together. That's the value of the gathered church. And then as we scatter, we live to minister. We have phones, and, and we can care, and notes, and, and we we're, we're care about people. We're the hands and the feet of Jesus, encouraging one another. That's what we're encouraging in the faith, encouraging to grow in grace. We do that. That's what we need to do is we are our brother's keeper. Remember that? 
that terrible question that Cana, am I my brother after having killed his brother? And so we need to do that and we're, because we're ever mindful of what? The exceedingly sinfulness of sin. I mean, we all have sins. The church is uh, uh, recovering sinners. That's what I am, that's what you are, that's sanctification, right? I'm not what I was, I'm not what I'm gonna be, but thank God you're working me and conforming me in the likeness of Jesus. And that exceedingly sinfulness of sin, it lies, it deceives us, that sin is our problem. You say, well, I have a problem with man. I don't seem to get it, you know. It, you may have that problem, but that's not your core problem, and it's not my core problem. I can't balance my check. Well, that's a problem, right? But that's not your core problem. Your core problem is the flesh that we still have. Paul said at one point, Oh, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the bonds of this death? But thanks be unto the Lord Jesus Christ that gives us the victory. One day, I mean, in heaven it's going to be so great because we won't have this, this flesh, this indwelling sin principle that pollutes us and corrupts us and draws us down and away from the Lord. The idols of our heart. Our hearts are idol makers. We elevate things to the place that belongs to the God. All day long, we need to keep that as a Lord, help me. I need thee every hour, even as we sang. Oh my. Well, these were not able to enter into the land of rest in the morning there is for us disbelief always brings with it restlessness no peace and finally death but the second part of this god's warning urging us not to miss not to miss the rest he provides through faith in the son is simply this belief always brings rest and it brings life abundant life Oh my, when we take God at his word, it settles deep into our heart, and then we act upon it. Oh, praise God for the, the peace of God, peace with God, and the peace of God that God gives. No matter what befalls me, Jesus doeth all things well. He's working his purpose. You know, I'm a child of a father. I don't know what it is. But God gives peace. Don't you love the fruit of the Spirit? I pray that in Galatians 5 every day. Faith and I do. You know, we pray love. May the fruit of the likeness of Jesus be, in, be in, that others would see Jesus in love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, patience, self control. Lord, peace and joy. God gives that, that. Listen, the weary, the unsaved don't have that, even when the pressure's on. But God gives us that, visits us that, when we believe. It means we, we take God at His word. God said it, amen, that's it. That's it. And it's God's work in us. It's not of us. It's not native to us to do that. We have a far larger picture of ourselves than we want. We think we're God, and He is not, or we try to use God impossible but he is god and we're his children we cry out to the father and he visits us with peace and finally life and, and at matthew 11 don't you love that i quoted here jesus said come unto me you are weary and burdened and i'll give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for i'm gentle and humble and hard and you will find rest for your soul rest rest Rest. We've taken numerous <clears throat> groups of, uh, of believers to Israel, right? And to see the sites of Mount Calvary, Gordon's Calvary, and all that. And you sing. We do a little, little course with the faith and I go. We take a little chorus book and pass it around and come to these in various areas, read some scripture, and we sing a song there. It's beautiful. People say, are you a choir? I say, well, no, we're not a choir. We just love the Lord. And there's a joy and peace and a rest. And the opposite of restlessness, worry, and calamity, right? There's peace and joy, beauty, peace. Come unto me and I'll give you rest. Oh, we're burdened, aren't we? Encumbered with a lot of cares and worries and troubles, danger without danger within, you know, and and God visits us with that rest, peace, life, rest. It's wonderful. 
rest. And the rest, chapter 4, verse 1, is still available even today. Today, it's still available for you and for me. And you're urged uh, again and again to make sure that you're in the rest that Jesus provides today. Today. In other ways, today is the day of salvation. In Corinthians, Paul said that. Why is it important that we, we recognize that? You know, when people hear the gospel, they hear the wonder of God's word, and God tenderizes their heart, awareness of sin, the wonder of God's love, and the cross, and Jesus, and there's a wooing and a calling there, and, and the important thing is for believers, professed believers, is to respond to that. Respond. Don't say no. Don't say manana. Today is the day when God's, your heart is being tenderized by God's love and the Savior. Today is the day to call upon the Lord Jesus and to be saved. Not tomorrow. What's the problem? The problem with the exceeding sinfulness of sin, our hearts easily get callous. They get hardened over, layer after layer. That's one of the great wonders of working with children, you know. The, 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 they've not got all that educated sophistication, right? The yeah, buts, yeah, buts, but they're very open. They're hearing about the teaching of Jesus, and their hearts are tender, and, and they'll respond more readily uh, to, uh, to a gospel, even a genuine gospel, a genuine conversion. Uh, and, uh, and I urge you, when God is calling, don't delay. The longer it delays, you go into adulthood, and our hearts can get very callous over. We live in a world that's no friend of grace. Satan is the God who roams this world, runs educational places and other things like that. And the, the atheism and godlessness of it can really callous our sinful heart. And it's like, oh, I remember that years ago, but I never responded. Callous. Callous. You know, it's one thing to get callous on your hands. Sometimes I get working, doing different things, and, and uh, I haven't done that kind of work in a while. I get a blister, and I keep working, it gets harder and harder, and it turns hard. You know, I, but it gets dull. It gets uh, insensitive to the touch. Have you ever noticed that? And, and that's our hearts. When they become dull, they become hardened. And the author is saying, today, respond. If God is wooing and calling, and you may profess Christ, know a lot about Jesus, but you're not saved. I always give that example of, of saving faith, uh, and, and I think it's apropos here, where a ship is going to go down in the North Atlantic, and the captain uh, goes to the crew that are on board, he said, listen, we're going down, that's it, we're done, I sent off the signal and all that, and but I checked, there's, a, there's an island over here, it's two miles to the north, there's the lifeboats, get in the boats and save yourself, right? All right, so the first group says, and I hear what you're saying, but I don't believe you. You, uh, you, you always hated us, and you hope we drown, right? I don't believe you. That's the first group, right? The second group, the sailors say, uh, I hear what you're saying. I think it's true. But they never go over to the boat, and they go down with the ship, and they die. That's this group. I believe it's true. Never act upon it, never receive Christ as Savior, and they perish. The only ones that were delivered are those that hear, heard the word from the captain, said, That's true, went over to the lifeboats, got in it, and saved their lives, went to that island, and they were delivered. That's saving faith. There are many people who have never heard the gospel, but there are some that hear it and go, like, Yeah, oh, that's nonsense, I don't believe it, right? Because of this exceedingly sinfulness of our hearts and the dullness of our, our ears, right? Here. Then some say, well, yes, that is true, like intellectually, knowledge, and all, but never act upon it. That's who he is addressing here. He's like trying to give them a push into receiving Christ the Lord as Savior. And the question is, have you done that today? I would do it for every one of you. Paul would do that for his fellow Jews. He says that in Romans chapter 9 and then verse and chapter 10, he would give us his own heart. Have you trusted Jesus? Do you know a lot about Jesus? Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but have you ever made him your own Lord and Savior by a simple prayer of faith? Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I receive you as my Lord and my God. 
thank you for dying and paying for all of my sin and Calvary's cross. That's the difference. That's going over and getting in the lifeboat and being delivered from your sin. Belief always leads you, see, it always leads to rest, peace, Sabbath, and finally, the abundant life that is found only in Jesus. Oh, it's wonderful beyond words. Wonderful. Wow. He closes this section uh, just highlighting in the last two verses, verses 12 and 13 of our passage, highlighting that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper. It is the Word of God, and it is God's wonderful. He gives a sevenfold description. It's the Word that shows us up for who we are. I love today with medical technology and the MRIs this past week. I'm sorry to say uh, our son was playing basketball, John, to us. And uh, though he's planning to get married here soon, right? He's been canceled four times with the COVID-19. That in playing basketball, he tore his Achilles tendon and was in unbelievable pain. Monday, he had surgery on Wednesday. And I talked to him Tuesday, and he said they did an MRI, and they x-rayed it, and this is, yes, here's the news. And the wonderful diagnostic equipment that we have to answer. Uh, when I was a kid, they didn't have that, right? I remember Dad saying about a neighbor. They thought he had a problem, and they didn't want to open him up. But when they open him up, oh, when they open him up, there it is. It's cancer. He's dead. That's the way they used to think of it. Now we got all this diagnostic stuff. It's non-invasive. It's wonderful, really. It's a gift from God for us in this thing. Well, something even more diagnostic equivalent than that is God's Word. As we read the Word, it shows us up for who we are. It says, and it shows us whether we are genuine believers or not, whether it's just a profession or faith, or it's a real genuine deal. And then he ends up saying in the last verse that even God, did, did, have you read that last verse? And nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of to whom we must give an account. In other words, God knows those who are his. Oh, today a version. In the view of all the miracles of creation, life, this world, the cosmos, the glory of the sun, the seasons, don't we love summer, flowers, all the beauty that God is in, the air we breathe, in the sweet spot of the universe, and here's the earth, and the oceans are beautiful, the great thermostats, and the periodic table, and thermodynamics, and electro all the wonders of this stuff. God does all of that. He's great and glorious, and he loves that he provided his only son. Oh, maybe you know all of that. And I, like the writer here, would urge you to come to a place where you say, I'll have him as my own. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's my God, my King, my all in all. The superiority of Jesus. Danger. Not all dangers are the same. They're not. Warning. The danger of unbelief leads to restlessness, leads to death. Oh, let that, that be when we get the glory, I'm looking for all of you, all of you, all of you. Oh my, oh my, shall we pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful warning, Father. It just tells us danger. Oh, may we take it to heart and not just let other noise and the din of the crowd and of life crown out. Today is the day of salvation. I pray you'd open the heart of the man or woman, boy or girl, this morning, that they'd say, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you. You're not only my creator, but you're my redeemer, my Lord, my God, my all. All to you. I love you, Lord. Thank you for dying for me. And for the great number of us here that know you, may we love you more and serve you through the, 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 the days of our life where each day say, fly by. And don't they fly by. Oh, Lord, thank you. We love you so. Christ. Jesus.